Hello, everyone. We are back already. It was a little shorter than five minutes since we went over time. Um, but as uh, mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago, we are here now with um, Professor Jana Kula, who we've brought back to moderate um, a one-on-one -on -one discussion uh, with Mustafa Suleiman, um, who she will also introduce. Um, they will have 45 minutes to discuss many interesting themes, um, ranging from uh, applying AI research and practice, talking about AI and health, AI ethics. Um, so without further ado, um, Jana and Mustafa, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, dear Mustafa Suleiman, so nice to have you here. Thank you so much for your time. I'm really looking forward to meet you and having this uh, conversation. <clears throat> let, me, let me start with one first question. Uh, today, um, innovation is on the agenda, applications, Many people ask, what can we do with AI? What is your vision about how this technology or the entire range of technologies that we have under this umbrella uh, can be applied? Which, which applications do you think are the next big topics and hot topics and where can we make the biggest positive impact? Well, well first of all, thank you, Jana, for having me and thank you, Aspen. I'm, I'm very pleased to, to be here. Um, yeah, so I, I think this is an interesting question and I actually get asked it a lot, you know, where is the field headed? And people often wonder, what is the pace of change? Like, how, are, are we actually accelerating? Are things getting faster or are things slowing down? And we seem to constantly be torn between, on the one hand, feeling very frustrated that our breakthroughs are not being implemented in practice even more swiftly and also very anxious that things are changing too quickly. And, um, you know, there's a nervousness and a fear that the you know, entire landscape around us is changing. And so I, I feel that often the, the debate gets stuck between those two extremes. Um, in practice, I think the, the practical reality is that we um, are making steady progress towards applying AI in real world environments. But naturally, AI depends on significant amounts of training data that has been collected from real world environments. That data is often messy and noisy. It's unstructured. Often it needs cleaning and well labeling. Um, and the prediction environment itself needs to be structured in a way that enables your um, machine learning system to land well and be embedded effectively. Um, and so there's actually a lot of prerequisites that need to be put in place before we can benefit from AI. I think one of the um, you know, more challenging things of the last five years in terms of the application of AI is that I think people had underestimated how much uh, sort of infrastructure work needs to go in uh, in order to make the, the sort of AI final piece very successful. I mean, in some ways the AI is the kind of the icing on the cake. I mean, uh, underneath there is a huge amount of work that goes into building infrastructure, to testing models, to building software systems, to um, you know, dealing with the kind of societal and policy elements of a new technology. And I think the field is sort of finally catching up to the great breadth of uh, skills and capabilities that we have to um, have in place in order to get the benefit of AI. So with all of that said, I would I still feel incredibly optimistic about the potential for um, AI to truly revolutionize healthcare. I mean, you know, as, as many people have talked about over the years, healthcare is uh, an incredibly expensive drain on our collective GDP. And as, you know, the middle class emerges over the next couple of decades in um, less developed countries, um, they're going to expect quite reasonably um, healthcare that is as effective, um, if not as potentially resource draining as we experience in, um, you know, sort of Europe, and uh, America and other countries. And that means that we're going to have to get far more efficient and far more accurate at both detecting uh, disease before it spreads, preventative medicine and diagnosing it when it does, um, and increasingly being able to generate new uh, interventions, whether they be drugs interventions or behavior changes using machine learning systems. And we've already seen some of the um, early indications that we can do this. Um, so particularly in the area of image um, recognition and in the field of 
um, x-rays, chest x-rays, or um, uh, CT scans, or um, you know, um, optimal coherence tomography, OCT, three-dimensional eye scans. We've shown, um, and many other groups have shown, um, that we can train systems that perform as well as, or if not in some cases, better than the best human experts around the world. And, and this is really significant work because, you know, in, instead of it costing, you know, many, many hundreds of thousands uh, of dollars to train these experts and many decades to, to learn all of these cases that they have been through in order to perform their diagnoses, you know, we can now uh, train systems that learn all of that almost within an instant. And so that should reduce the cost of reviewing these examinations to you know, really a commodity price and ensure that they're made available worldwide. I mean, you know, they, these should naturally spread through markets as more and more people demand um, the highest quality uh, you know, diagnoses. So I think there's, there's real reasons to be optimistic, but it's gonna take um, you know, a number of years before we start to see um, machine learning systems in, in, in highly sensitive application areas like healthcare. And I think we have to still be optimistic, but also be patient. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> a difficult thing. <laughs> so so what, what is one, um, like a reason for that we need to be patient? Do you believe or do you also agree that we cannot really put this into practice until these systems can really under, uh, explain their diagnosis and we are sure that they work based on the, let's say, correct causal models? Is that something? You know, frankly, I think this is perhaps one of the most uh, interesting and sensitive ethical challenges of our day, because at some point, the performance of a machine learning system, let's say for um, diagnosing, uh, you know, cancers in, in CT scans um, or for diagnosing um, potential diseases that cause blindness in eye scans, at some point, those scans, those diagnosis systems, are going to be so good that for every month or every year that we delay implementing them, uh, because we want to ensure that they're absolutely perfect and they really don't make any errors, for every month that we delay, um, people will be, you know, suffering uh, uh, consequences of those diseases that go undiagnosed. Yet, on the other hand, we do know that um, these systems suffer an underspecification problem. I mean, we we do uh, you know we're working very hard on trying to ensure they reproduce the same um, accuracy and performance um, in their prediction outputs over and over again. This this question of reproducibility is a really um, you know difficult one. I mean, naturally, mm. these are stochastic systems. There's an inherent uh, you know sort of uh, you know, probability prediction that is involved in, in the way that they're trained and built. So there is going to be some variance. And so this question of at what point do we tip the balance and deploy, I think is the real big uh, sort of moral question of our day for the next, for the next mm. 10 years. Well, we definitely also see systems that will be deployed quickly because the need is so yeah. high. As you said, you know, we currently also see how fast we move to actually beat the virus and we can have, uh, effectively move and uh, nobody would have expected us how, how much is uh, it's accelerating the change. I think so even like, if, as you said, if the, the risk of not using it is higher than the risk of using it, but maybe there are some uh, mistakes at uh, some time, then we'll definitely move forward. Yeah, that's right. And part of the challenge is going to be creating consensus around our prediction about the risks of harm versus the risks of good. Because, mm -hmm. you know, th that's a really challenging future probabilistic estimate. So the question is achieving consensus around that. And that has to do with governance and accountability. I mean, which mm -hmm. body, which group, which regulator, which company, which startup, which NGO gets to make that decision or have input in that decision? Mm -hmm. Um, and as the stakes get higher, that's going to, as the sensitivity of those, you know, obviously the stakes and who gets to participate becomes very, very important. I mean, it's a, that's a theme that I have been uh, very passionate about for many years. And I've tried very experimentally to, to, to figure out what the right structure is to ensure that broad groups of people get to participate. And I think we're 
quite a long way off. There's a, there's a lot more work we need to do in order to ensure that the process is trusted, right? Because it's not just about trusting the, the output of the system. There are very few people who are technically capable of being able to scrutinize that system and make it accountable and understandable and transparent. I think that we should really focus on the process, like who has been involved and who mm -hmm. has participated, who's contributed, which um, you know, diverse and minority voices have, have been able to be aired in, in contributing to that decision-making process. That's really the tough stuff that we've got to grapple with if we want to accelerate mm -hmm. the deployment of AI in the next decade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. I would also like to come back to what you mentioned about uh, putting infrastructure in place. For example, in my presentation, I brought up the, the example of uh, GPS-based navigation. You know, co computing a shortest uh, route on a map is uh, can be easily done with heuristic search, but the thing, the entire application becomes really useful when we can link it to uh, an, a real-time navigation infrastructure. And I'm wondering, like when we talk about healthcare, and you you just mentioned also, we need, for example, a process of how we introduce technology that we have certain structures in place out to to apply certain regulations. What, what type of infrastructure do you imagine? Apart, for example, regulatory bodies maybe, what could this be or where do you see this? But also in terms of, for example, in infrastructure for sharing healthcare data, probably also at the global level. There are many concerns immediately coming up, but it's definitely the case that sharing these data and, and making them available to, to a broader analysis uh, brings up uh, or brings in a lot of value. Yeah. yeah, that's a really great question and a complicated question. Um, I, I think the it's the job of the regulator to create the environment to incentivize us to do the right thing. So, you know, the, the privacy requirements with respect to data sharing need to be explicit and clear and, and very you know, easy to follow and comply with and the requirement. And in that environment, I'm very confident that we can innovate our way through that quote unquote problem. You know, you, you referred to the challenge of needing to do essentially pseudonymized or maybe even anonymized data sharing so that we can all collectively contribute our own medical record into a you know public uh you know pot of uh you know so that we can you know, derive benefits for the benefit of everybody and, and our and our families and our friends and our communities um without compromising our individual privacy which is clearly really important now these are engineering challenges it's you know we we can set a bar with respect to regulatory requirements and public trust issues and then we can say you know it's up to the companies it's up to my company and and you know my research colleagues to try and solve this problem i mean this is an eminently solvable problem if the incentives are right this is not beyond us we, mm. we this this can be solved infrastructure can be built to do this and, and I, I you mentioned um the response to covid you know frankly i think that one of the bright spots in this awful uh pandemic of of the last year has been uh the way that um apple and google got together to build a privacy preserving exposure notifications infrastructure i mean google is essentially running infrastructure mm. that it's completely blind to that, you know, there is really no reason not to trust completely Google's implementation here because, um, you know, Google is sort of, and, and Apple are, are jointly operating this on behalf of, of, of the public and can't see any of the contacts um, or the relations between Bluetooth beacons that intersect with one mm -hmm. another in order to detect, uh, to do contact tracing and, and uh, you know, generate an alert when somebody has, 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 has become positive. I think that this is a really interesting template that we um, should look to explore uh, in the coming years as, a, as mm -hmm. a way, not only because it created a nice forcing function for us to build something very quickly, um, but, but also because we had a cross-company collaboration very, very fast, uh, making privacy you know, the number one design parameter uh, and building something which you know, really is in the public interest and really can change things. I can imagine similar kinds of systems when it comes to the managing of um, your sensitive personal data, be it for health, maybe be it for your um, immuniz immunization certificate, for your identity management tools, so presenting your government ID, for example. Um, you know, the, there are many similar sorts of applications of this kind of uh, public-private infrastructure that needs to be 
you know, ha have absolute, um, you know, privacy guarantees in order for it to be trusted and therefore useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a very interesting thought. And um, so um, the solution seems to be to really have the data distributed in various safe uh, spaces, but allow also the data to come together for certain purposes, instead of, for example, establishing one body that owns all data, for example. Right, right, absolutely. I mean, I, I personally quite like the metaphor that data is a commons. You know, it, it exists because we collectively invest into it, we collectively create it and contribute it. And I think that there, that we should collectively reap the benefits of that. Um, and so this question of interoperability and portability, uh, you know, which I know that the European Commission has, has made a big priority in, in recent uh, legislative efforts. I think this is really important and, um, you know, is, is, is the right kind of um, trajectory. Um, mm -hmm. But in, in some ways, that's kind of one side of infrastructure. That's technical infrastructure. Um, the other side of infrastructure I mean, you might call it infrastructure, but it, it has to do with how we invest in research and development. And um, you know, I think that people often, um, you know, sort of worry that you know universities, in terms of their AI, uh, you know, professors and, and support are underfunded and, and so on. And I and I think that this is a, a, a serious concern we have to take seriously. And but but it is actually a very solvable problem. I mean, really, it comes down to money. <laughs> you know, it, at the moment in the UK, for example, I, I think the um, the spending to 1.7 percent of GDP. You know, which is really quite low for countries of similar GDP and similar size to us. I mean, in, in Germany, it's actually relatively high. It's 3%. In the US, it's 3%. But if you look at the most innovative, uh, you know, some of the most innovative countries in the world, this, you know, like Israel, for example, or South Korea, they're spending 4, 4.5, 5 percent of GDP. You know, this is really all it takes. Like, pay academics well, um, create many, many institutes, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, create a lot of status around academics. Don't disrespect them or belittle them. And you know, I think we have to really big up our research, uh, you know, institutes because they're the future of us being able to solve some of the most challenging problems mm -hmm. that we see over the next couple of decades, whether it's farming and food or mobility or energy, uh, you know, and our climate crisis. That's really where we, I think we should be investing. Mm. And it's as simple as the political question of, of spending. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How do you see the distribution of all this money? I, in, in general, there is quite some money available for research. And we, I think we see interesting phenomena. For example, we see institutions, they constantly ask for more and more money. And then they say, yeah, yeah and then we can deliver more. But then there are these small teams. They don't have much money, but they have the bright ideas. So sometimes it seems to me that it could even be too much money. Should What, what do you think is a good uh, balance here? Having yeah. enough resources, but still remaining creative and not uh, just becoming a money raising and money burning machine. So for example, there are discussions that professors spend more time on reviewing papers and, and f looking for or writing, branding or proposals and so on, instead of spending time on research these days. Yeah, it's a great, I mean, two, the two great points there, I, I agree. I mean, first of all is the question of Personally, very much in favor of, um, you know, academic environments or sort of public sector investment, let's call it, in solving grand challenges, um, in establishing institutes that are set up to tackle a specific problem within a limited time frame with a very measurable goal with funding that ends after a fixed period. I mean, I think that you mm -hmm. know, to have a longer conversation about tenure, but I, I don't think more tenured professors is necessarily the right way to, it's the only way mm -hmm. to solve the problem. Like clearly it's necessary and important. What, what I'm kind of more getting at is that we need public interested engineering, you know, to, to build very large scale R&D investments in our tough problems. There's, there's a huge class of problems which are not quite venture capital problems. They're definitely not private equity problems and which some of the big tech companies particularly are starting to experiment with, but they're doing it with a tiny fraction of their investment. And, mm -hmm. and though this class of problems are too big for the current research 
uh, you know, academic research environment. They're not set up to run 500 person engineering teams, software engineering teams or experimental mm -hmm. teams. Uh, they, you know, they're, they're mostly experienced and used to running 30 person labs at the most. And so there's, that, that's why I feel that we're, we're kind of a little bit stuck. We're certainly not making progress fast enough with these grand challenges. And you know, I, I think they do require very big checks. And, and we have to accept that the error rate is going to be much higher than it would be you know, in traditional public sector investment. We, we have to tolerate failure. I, indeed, we have to celebrate failure. You know, I, I think these are like multiple billion euro investments over five to seven year periods. And we have to expect an error rate of 50, 60, 70% in terms of achieving the big goal. Many other derivative benefits will come from it, but that's really what it takes, I think, to make progress because at the mm -hmm. moment, there's just these set of problems which fall between two uh, worlds. And, and as a result, I think we're, we're sort of missing out and, and, and it's frustrating. Mm -hmm. But this also seems to require quite different organization forms. For example, the European Union had set up this network to tackle the human brain project, but there is common agreement that it wasn't as effective as, as initially thought. So yeah. if we stay with these traditional structures, small professors who value freedom over everything, individuality, teams, and on the other hand, you just describe uh, a structure where people really work in a team. There is a very planned process, uh, quality assurance, testing, trying out ideas, really going through the end and so on. So this seems to be quite different from a traditional academic uh, attitude. I, I completely agree. It's, it's, it's quite different. Um, I, I think part of the challenge with these very large multi-country, multi-university efforts is that um, it's very difficult to coordinate when people are working one or two, three days a week. You know, that, that most of those investments were quite part-time. Um, I'm personally a very big believer in a full-time commitment in hiring mm -hmm. an engineering team, you know, led by researchers who like are, you know, really, they have skin in the game. They're really committed. This is what they're gonna be working on for five years. They're part of this mission. And, you know, it means that they'll have to choose to take a different track to publications and the academic route of, 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 of managing PhDs mm -hmm. and so on. And, and that's fine. It's not that we should underinvest in any of the existing academic side. I think we should. I think that this is really new investment that's required to tackle these grand challenges and, and do so, you know, in, in a way that is, is, is more like the way that big companies, I think, address these problems but 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 more so with the kind of public interest and the public sector spirit mm -hmm. um, yeah it's it i mean i also spent uh, nearly 10 years in ibm research and it seems to me that industrial research compared to academic research for certain goals is today the the more effective type of organization yeah yeah, interesting. But let's maybe move on a little bit in the innovation process. So uh, we have all these uh, nice uh, technology now in place. Things will mature further. Companies like Google put frameworks around us. Then we have cloud services that uh, smaller companies for, can, for example, use to access the uh, technology. And um, I wonder if you could... Um, share with us some of your insights for example there's also one question and somebody said yeah how what is your thinking process when you design new ai based applications or business models and also are there tips that i mean it always it's the application like say that the possibility was of the technology is one side having the business model in place that really allows us to leverage this technology in, in, a, in a viable way such that it is also profitable for example it can really be maintained for a longer time uh, based on its income is, is another story and then of course there are the users do the users desire this application will they uh, really adopt it and like it and so on so what is your thinking process when you have all these ideas in your mind and which one do you go for or what are the first questions you ask before you take a decision yeah the, i mean great questions i mean so um some of the first questions I ask is, what kind of prediction problem is this? So um, what, what, it, what exactly does an end user need to experience to benefit from this technology? Um, and that means that I need 
perceived end users and try and understand their problem because too often I see, um, you know, we call it hammers looking for nails, <laughs> you know, where there's we, there's a pre-existing piece of technology and we think it works well in research and we're just looking for any mm. problem that looks like it will be solved by our solution. Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a classic error that, that research, you know, applied researchers tend to make. So I, I like to really embed myself with, um, you know, the, the, the users that I'm trying to solve for. So in the case of all the healthcare work that I've done over the last five years, I spent a huge amount of time on the wards talking to nurses, with doctors. I did many night shifts. I went out into the community. Mm -hmm. You know, I drove around in, in you know, um, vehicles, like many, many things to try and understand. The same when um, I did the, the data center work. Um, we, we, we improved the efficiency of Google data centers uh, very significantly by 30% a few years ago. Um, and, you know, we spent a lot of time talking to data center engineers who were just really thrilled to have us kind of spend days with them asking very detailed questions. You know, and you get an instinct for like how they think, the language they use, the vocabulary and so on and so forth. And, and that's clearly the first thing to do. Um, I think the second thing to do is be very honest with yourself about the business model here. Um, most of the time so far with the, with the methods that have been developed, particularly with deep learning, which is probably the most applied AI that we have at the moment, most of the time the output is by making something more efficient. So you're going to be saving time and you're going to be increasing accuracy of an existing process, uh, whether that is you know, sort of image recognition or speech recognition or any kind of error detection. Um, and that's great because it improves quality. So in, in healthcare, it's really important and really valuable. But, but often the market dynamics um, for established markets don't always incentivize improvements in quality. Um, what they're often looking for is a specific reduction in cost. So you might save time you know, even if you're a gas engineer detecting for leaks or broken pipes, you know, on an oil rig or something, you know, you might, you know, you have to really be able to prove that you're not just saving the engineer's time, but you're reducing the number of catastrophic incidents um, or for improving the efficiency of nurses and doctors being able to communicate with one another. You might be able to say that you've improved the quality and accuracy, uh, which is great for the patient. But does it re reduce the actual bottom line cost of running the service? And I think um, that's one of the challenges that I think the whole community is sort of figuring out at the moment. It, it, we know that it does and we know that it will in the long term. It's just in order to catalyze very large scale uptake, quick, uh, uptake quickly, mm -hmm. um, it's clearly all about the money. And uh, mm -hmm. that, that's an important consideration. Mm -hmm. So then uh, we'll... So you say that we, the focus is really on quality, it should be on quality, and but of course uh, we need to somehow pack it, pack it nicely under the, the, the cost <laughs> umbrella. And um, yeah, that's definitely uh, important that we don't go for things that are like short wins yeah, in terms of money, but rather go for the deep quality uh, improvements that we can actually achieve. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to ask you when you um, when you said uh, deep learning, yeah, and then people, um, of course, for many people, AI um, is deep learning at the moment. Um, uh, you said also, yeah, you need to know your user. I mean, be your first user. For example, if you don't like it to use your own technology, then that's probably not uh, nobody else will like it. But of course, understanding the uh, the domain, understanding the usage scenarios, the processes, and so on, is very important. Maybe. Just uh, one provocative question. Can you imagine of a specific application where deep learning might not be the best possible technology? Yeah, I mean, so, so deep learning is typically useful where you are trying to sort of classify uh, a bunch of existing known objects and you're taking a retrospective data set, which is already well labeled, and you're asking the algorithm to reproduce the underlying structure that is already established in an existing data set. There are many, many examples of data environments which just don't have that kind of well-labeled classification structure. And in those cases, 
um, you know, the deep learning methods haven't quite evolved and there's still a lot of, you know, work to do in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the second area that, you know, one should be cautious of, I think, is um, sort of non-stationary or dynamic environments where the structure of the environment changes as your algorithm makes an intervention into that environment. Mm -hmm. so where there is this sort of continuous dynamic interaction um, that can produce a lot of emergent uh, consequences or properties of the environment, which become very, very difficult to model. And so far, the supervised deep learning methods, um, you know, not, not really suitable for those sorts of environments. Mm -hmm. If in particular, if such environments are not fully deterministic. So yeah. in some pro production and manufacturing processes, we actually can see this. And there are, there are definitely limits to supervised learning, but also to reinforcement learning, because we can't really create a simulation environment where we can try to learn, because I mean, the behavior is so hard to predict. And also, even for experts, they can't really describe what's going to happen. Yeah, that's a perfect mm. example. Yeah, I mean, re reinforcement learning has so far not yet been well scaled, um, mm. something that I worked on for many years. And, you know, we've we've so far not really been successful in finding very good large scale applications of reinforcement learning. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I think that it will come with time, but it's still an area of active research. Mm. Yeah, for me, it's interesting because... Uh, on the one hand, the AI methods reach certain uh, limitations here in these domains, but uh, human engineers nevertheless manage to control these processes. Mm -hmm. And uh, they do it apparently at a level of abstraction that we haven't yet uh, discovered for AI solutions. Because they somehow can draw their attention to the key points and then actually see if everything is still okay or not. And yeah, this is very, very hard to figure out how this is going on and how this happens. It's that's a very nice point. I, I agree with you. The the um, you know a, a like one definition of intelligence is the ability to direct attention mm -hmm. to salient features in environment at the right time. And you know mm -hmm. if if we could solve that problem, you're solving a nested hierarchy of other yeah. sub problems, which are really critical to the field. Yeah. And, you know, clearly yeah. that's what humans are incredibly good at. We can go back through our entire experience and pull out that exact moment. That's the magic at the moment of being human. And, and there are many, many, uh, you know, areas of research that are focused on this problem um, called mm -hmm. temporal, well, mostly around temporal credit assignment, how to as assign value to a particular uh, effective or rewarding moment mm. that the algorithm has experienced in the past in order to recall it and reproduce it at the right moment. And, um, mm. you know, I think it's it's still some way off before we're, we're successful with that, but it's it's an area of active research. Yeah, that, that's, that's a very uh, good point that you are making here. So uh, you would also say that um, probably artificial general intelligence is still uh, quite far away because we have no systems yet that have this capability, but humans definitely have it yeah I, th I think we're very far away. well i think we're very far away yeah i i, I think okay. it's uh, okay. um you know it's 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 a little bit of a distraction the language and the hype around the agi uh focus i think and i think in practice there are going to be so many more barriers to deploying software systems and you know more narrow practical ai tools over the next five to ten years that that's going to consume the majority of our attention and focus as a regulatory field, as a as a community of um, of NGOs and activists, and obviously as a, a community of businesses and industry too. We're just going to be focused on that for the for the time being, which is great. Mm, I see. And um, maybe let's come back um, to this point where you said that. Um, um, like we we need to understand the customers. We need to think about the business model. And now let's say we have good solutions and now we have that prototype and it works well and now there is this critical transition of course we've tested it and so on we've been in the real world but now comes this really broad deployment and it's not so rare that applications that worked extremely well while they were developed then then suddenly fail in the real world do you yeah. have tips how to avoid this problem i don't yeah. even know if there's a name for this but it seems to <laughs> should have, deserve one <laughs> Yeah, it, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. There, there is a name for it, actually. It's called the under-specification problem. And in, in mm -hmm. fact, uh, a group of uh, uh, researchers, some of whom were at Google 
published a really excellent paper. Yeah, I've seen those. Yeah. A month ago. Yeah, I mean that that's exactly what you're describing, which is, you know, no, you know, despite significant amounts of testing in simulated environments, it's incredibly difficult to replicate the complexity of the real world. And by definition, you know, any system that you put in the real world is going to encounter novel in you know um, uh, novel instances that it has to respond to. And, you know, these are not deterministic, heuristic-based systems. I mean, we're, the, the, we've, we've explicitly moved away from, you know, logical, if this, then that rules. And so mm-hmm. by definition, there is, uh, you know, some, some stochasticity in the model in order for it to cope with novelty. And, um, you know, quite often or sometimes that novelty appears to be beyond the bounds of, you know, the, the training system and it, and it will produce something which is, you know, turns out to be undesirable in the, the real world environment. And I think often that's because, you know, it's difficult for people who are even training these systems to imagine, you know, these kinds of scenarios ahead of time. Like it's a huge amount of absorb as, as a, an engineer or as a designer. And I think this is the reason why we have to have, you know, much more robust um, you know, testing and training uh, mm. um, protocols beforehand. And everybody in the field is working aggressively towards this. In fact, the partnership on AI uh, a few weeks ago, which is the sort of um, cross-industry um, NGO collaboration, just released um, what they've called an AI incident database, which I think is a really cool idea. One of the many cool things they've done mm-hmm. um, where they're encouraging um, people who have deployed real world systems to share their experiences of um, you know, systems that have made mistakes and errors and so on and so forth to, to learn from collective best practices. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, th- I think these are the kinds of things that will help us to you know, minimize the kind of undesirable effects and, and, and try and Im- mm-hmm. improve accuracy and stability over time. Yeah, I have the impression that also relates to what you described earlier. And when you said, yeah, uh, would intelligence means that I can really draw my attention to something that is important in this particular moment. And of course, deep learning relies on all these low level features that it can process so very well. But of course, it cannot do this kind of abstraction that we need to actually draw the uh the attention to what is uh, a key feature here. And that's why we probably also see these problems. And this also means that we need to come up with quite uh, different techniques to improve the technology. So more, more, more data and more testing will not fundamentally change the problem. It can help to reduce uh, the, the, this problem, but it cannot fundamentally solve it. Yeah. There's, an, yeah, there's another question somebody wrote, is it really hard to recognize when something happens that surprises you? And I think this also relates nicely to what we discussed, because for us now, we are surprised, but AI systems can't be surprised. Huh? Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's a very good point. <laughs> and this is why, you know, safety systems require lots of checks and balances. I mean, if, if you look at the, the kind of history of, of other fields that have implemented safety uh, into their deployment, whether it's, uh, you know, n- nuclear uh, reactors or airplanes or in the military, for example, you know, redundancy is critical. And, um, you know, a series of logical checks and gates is is really how you protect, protect and you sort of reduce the number of possible, you know, undesirable outcomes. And so I think what we'll start to see is that the safety regime around deployment of AI in high stakes environments will have an additional layer of human imposed logic and business heuristics. You know, for example, mm-hmm. no recommendations beyond a specific bound or, you know, mm-hmm. as soon as, uh, you know, more training inputs are demanded than, are, you know, as, as soon as, um, you know, recommendations or, or, or training examples are consumed and are required, then put a stop to the system. There's, you know, there's all kinds of bounds that you can put to constrain the, you know, agency, if you like, of a system. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's probably how we'll start to get around it, because it's not clear to me that these can be, um, you know, baked into the underlying um, prediction engine right from the outset, because obviously they're going to be surprising. And and, and Mm -hmm. so it's it's going to, I think, have to be an after effect that we'll have to get much better at. I mean, and and so far, this is just not, you know, um, frankly, because we haven't seen many high stakes 
deployments of, of AI, like in, uh, you know, self-driving cars, for example, are still just emerging. You're in healthcare, we're at the very early stages of the field and so on. So I think, um, you know, we're now sort of starting to put these kind of safety implementations in place. Hmm. Yeah, of, but of course, in industry, we see uh, applications, but of course, there's usually a multi-layer control system. So the AI system, for example, can control elevators or something, compute something, but there's, of course, an additional safety system, and we are in a, uh, also in a more uh, <clears throat> technical environment where we have also the complexity under control. So let me see, there are a few more questions. Maybe I take a few from the list. Uh, there's a question about open innovation. Does Google support uh, entrepreneurs who uh, have an idea and uh, could, can they apply for funding from Google? Uh, yes, yeah. Google has, I think, lots of programs for, um, you know, startup, for the startup ecosystem, for entrepreneurs, um, and, you know, particularly around Google Cloud, for example, there are a lot of workshops and 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 uh you know sort of um open access training courses and so on um so um you know there's there, there's there's a lot to to check out i would i would go to the website there's plenty of training programs and mm. mentoring support programs that, okay can you maybe point us to how people can find the website yeah i will send a i'll send a link i don't know off the top of my head but i'll i'll, I'll send you a link you can share with people okay and then the uh, as Man you can distribute it to the participants. Yeah. Okay. There is uh, there's a question actually coming back to our uh, discussion about artificial general intelligence. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with OpenCock, the system yeah. developed by Ben Gertzel. Do you want to comment on this one? Yeah. Yeah, I, I know Ben Gertzel and you know he started OpenCog I think in maybe 2008, 2009 or something and you know, it's a it's a very he's an extremely talented researcher. Um, he's he's been plugging away at this for many many years. I think I think with his father Ted Gertzel as well, and he has a small team. Um, you know, it's 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 good work. It's it's I think um, still not quite yet delivered on the on the grand uh, vision. But you know, I think the more efforts there are, the merrier. So yeah, I I think it's it's great and. As, as a theoretician about um, the future of AGI, I, th I think Ben Gertzel has made huge contributions to the field. Um, so, yeah, def definitely worth reading his work if you're interested in, mm. in AGI. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, there is a nice uh, proverb, and it, it says, um, first we shape our tools, and then our tools shape us. <laughs> yes. So yeah. if you I've, think about this and they are the future of AI, <laughs> what, what do you want it to do and where should it shape humans? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. I think, um, I mean, I think one of the things that I have tried hard to do over the years that I've been involved in this field is to refocus uh, the framing of AI towards one of tools that we design and we control. Right, we as humans mm -hmm. we collectively design them, and the question is, who gets to participate in the the values that get imbued in that design process? And the questions of ensuring that that they are representative and inclusive become really central. Um, but look, as we're seeing from the last three or four years or more, as as we all become you know sort of digital natives, you know, using our mobile phones all the time and being so fluent with technologies, they're changing the way that we relate to one another, the way that we see ourselves. Um, you know, and, and my instinct is that we have to be embracing and optimistic about how those tools shape us and not be afraid. Um, you know, I think, you know, to, to, to be afraid is to deny the reality of a huge, you know, sort of onslaught of change. Um, but at the same time, to not be, you know, naive or, um, you know, sort of trivialize the consequences. I mean, these tools are fundamentally changing our ability to be attentive, for example, or to concentrate. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they, in some cases, are, you know, explicitly appealing to our kind of hindbrain, uh, you know, reactivity um, in the way that we like things or share things or have a bias for short, snappy content, 
you know, um, so we have to be very, very sensitive to this. And in, in that sense, I think it's important that we genuinely consider the precautionary principle in this in this trade off where it's very hard to evaluate future harms and future benefits. We should be you know, proceeding cautiously um, because the the potential future harms become clear after the fact. And sometimes that can be, you know, too late. And so, um, you know, I think over the next few decades, we're going to have to think very carefully about about that that balancing. Because you're right, those those tools definitely do shape us. Yeah, and and the more powerful the technology becomes, uh, the more powerful our, is also the impact. And at Co, we want to make sure that it, uh, there's a positive one. Yeah, with this, we, we are nearly at the end. I want to thank you very much for all these uh, really interesting insights. And uh, you also sent the link. I can maybe just read it. It's very simple, startup.google.com. Yeah. So everybody is welcome yeah. to take a look there. And I would uh, like to uh, yeah give, give back to the organizers that they somehow join us and tell us what we do next or end the discussion. Thank you very much, and Professor Kula. That was a lot of fun. I enjoyed talking to you. Yeah, and I me too. Thank you very so much for your time. And I wish you really good success with your next endeavors. And I'm looking forward to hear more of these really deep impact papers and research from Google and uh, cool applications that we all use and, and like. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So, and now, where are the people? Professor uh, Köhler and Mustafa Suleiman, thank you so much for this fascinating exchange. I can't think of a better way to have ended this uh, third day of the Aspen Berlin AI conference. So many interesting uh, themes uh, we touched upon, um, starting with um, Professor Köhler's presentation this morning on applying artificial intelligence um, in different um, industry settings, some of the challenges related to that, transitioning um, to a panel discussion on startups, big players, and some of the challenges surrounding uh, innovation here in Germany. And now, of course, ending with this um, conversation between uh, Jana Köhler um, from the German um, Research Center for Artificial Intelligence and um, Mustafa Suleiman, who heads AI at Google. So thank you both again so much for joining us. Um, we have two more days uh, of programming um, planned for you. Um, tomorrow, starting um, as usual at 3 p.m., starting with a keynote presentation by David Autor, who's a professor at MIT and heads their work on uh, work of the future, so uh, make sure to tune in for that. Then we have a panel discussion on uh, Germany's EU Council presidency and Europe's quest for digital sovereignty. And then we will close tomorrow with another two-on-one -on conversation with Günther Oettinger, the former um, European Commissioner for um, the Digital um, Economy and Society. Um, and also former minister president of Baden-Württemberg. So um, thank you so much for tuning in and we look forward to seeing you all again tomorrow afternoon.